All right. Well, welcome everyone. Let's begin with a word of prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you for the privilege we have tonight to worship you through the study of your word. We're grateful, Lord, for all the good things you have given us and taught us through the study of the book of Jeremiah. Lord, today as we wrap up Jeremiah as a study, we pray that the teachings that pertain to us, that we need personally, would be remembered. And the things that are just of my opinion or things that are superfluous to where we are, Lord, that your spirit would help us discern those distinctions. And in the end, Father, we're always hoping that Jesus Christ will be magnified in our hearts and minds as we study your word. Because as the book of Hebrews says, of the volume of the book, it is about him. And so, Father, tonight we pray that even in Jeremiah we will see Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Brother Wilson has another question. Is it recording now? Yes. So, um, a few quick uh, preliminary words. This is my last midweek Bible study class. I've been doing them for 18 or so years here at the church. Have gone through probably two-thirds of the Bible. Um, there is a lot of books, you know, I could still go on if I was uh, staying here, but um, I intend to do it when I get to Nevada, but I don't know when that'll start. However, I do have a piece of, you know, interesting news. My wife has put together for me a YouTube page, which has the, the Bible classes, this one and past, at least the video ones. I don't think I, the audio ones are here. But uh, all you have to type in on YouTube is this phrase, Midweek Bible Class with Pastor Steve. And it pops right up. You'll see my handsome mug there, you know. Um, this picture was taken when I had a few more hairs, you know, on my head. But um, anyway, so if you ever want to, like, look at an old series or something like that, you're welcome to go to that YouTube page. Um, and you will have, you know, a couple that will be missing one, like, ch chapter because the projector didn't work or uh, Pastor Nathan did it instead or Peter did it instead. So those are a few of those that are, you know, intermixed in there. But by and large, uh, this is uh, several years worth, and uh, my wife was kind enough to put that together. But this is not a church page. This is just Steve's uh, YouTube page. And again, all you type in is Midweek Bible Class with Pastor Steve on YouTube, and it pops uh, right up. So keep that in mind. Also, I'm going to... Yes? Say it again? I think so. That was video. Um, the question was, for those watching online, is Isaiah on there? And I believe, I believe it is. Um, the other thing is I find, I, I, I should say I am going to find, I believe, that I may have more opportunities to hang out with some of you folks in Nevada than here. My point is here, you know, there's 2,000 people in the church and, you know, I have lunch with a couple of them, you know, here and there. But when people visit Nevada, like Marianne D'Antona went to visit Nevada last week with her daughter Faith who was in some horse event and she went out with lunch with Michelle. She hasn't done that here. <laughs> you know? And so they had a lovely time. Las Vegas happens to be kind of like a crossroads of the United States. And whether you gamble or not, people just have conventions and you know things that they do. They want to visit Hoover Dam or you know that kind of thing. I am 25 minutes from the airport in Las Vegas. Um, I am 25 minutes from Hoover Dam, you know, it's accessible. And so if you, I'm on Facebook, if you want to friend me on Facebook, you can be uh, kept up to speed as to uh, what's going on in my life. And my uh, email is pretty easy. The, the church email will eventually disappear, which is steve at shelterrockchurch.com. But my personal email is pretty easy. It's steve, S-T-E-V-E. -E, Tom, six, uh, T O M, six one, year I was born, at gmail.com. Steve Tom six one at gmail.com. And once people have been in my life to me, they're always in my life. 
I, I don't have this division of I leave behind. You know, I am still friends with people from Illinois when I pastor there. Um, it's the way I am. I'm, I'm wired that way. So if you have a theological question and you feel more comfortable with me than, you know, whatever, someone at the church, feel free to write. You know, I'll tell you what I think. And uh, I'm delighted to keep in touch. So keep those things in mind. Bob. What's the name of the YouTube again? The Midweek Bible Class. What you see it on the screen? What circle? Midweek Bible class with Pastor Steve. What does calm mean? Say it again. What does calm mean? Calm? Tom. Tom Tomlinson. Oh, you abbreviated? Yes, yes, yes. Tomlinson. So Steve Tom61 at gmail.com. Um, now, just because you guys have been sweet to me, m many of you for the, for the years, I'll let you the secret of where I'm preaching for the next three times, because these are my last three times. Um, I'm not preaching this coming week, although I have my How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth class on Saturday, which I love teaching that class. It's a fun one. Um, but the next time, on the 19th, I believe that's the date, that's a Sunday, I'm preaching my last time in Manhasset. Um, and uh, that will be special, because this is where I began. Um, this is the first place I ever preached, um, here at this church. And then the following week, whatever date that is, 25th, 26th, something, that's at Westbury. And then Palm Sunday is in Syosset. And so I am uh, looking forward to those opportunities. None of them are going to have like a cake or anything like that. I had my farewell two years ago. We had a special service, which we only did online because we were in COVID, but um, we did a special service. There was, you know, uh, letters, you know, all that kind of stuff. So this is just, you know, toodaloo, <laughs> howdy stuff, um, moving on. And Pastor Henry sounds really open about me coming back as frequently as I want to. And I have a son here. So I hope to see you guys, you know, from uh, time to time. What was that? We're not yet. Yeah, yeah, not quite, not quite. Still alive. <laughs> um, there's a Monty Python. I was sharing this with uh, Pastor Jim. I think it's Holy Grail. It's like, bring out your dead, you know, because it's the plague. But anyway, they're taking this guy and they're putting him on the dead cart. And he goes, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> oh, and they ha put him a hammer on his head. And it's like, okay, he's good now. <laughs> But uh, no, I'm not dead yet, you know, I, I, I still. And I have one other little piece of information, just for informational sake, and that is, um, you know, what's happening when I get there. I don't have a job arranged. There is a church I think could open up. Um, that pastor occasionally listens to my, you know, broadcast here, so I am not trying to put my uh, uh, cart before the horse. But we've clicked pretty well, and it's a church called Lake Mead Church uh, in Henderson. Uh, and uh, I would be kind of a discipleship pastor. And he loved the idea of the uh, online Bible study. And so he said, I'd love to have that here in this church. And if it does come there, I will let people know on Facebook and things that the Bible class is returned and um, it is available to be watched. He seemed very open to that. Um, but again, I'm not assuming he's going to um, take me on, but I would, I would like the church because of a couple things. It's a half mile from my house, which is pretty convenient. Um, secondly, they have a robust view of women in ministry, which I have come to value. Um, and so they haven't had a woman preacher yet, but they have a woman pastor on staff, executive pastor. That makes me happy because I have felt the Lord move us that way as a church. And I sense a very similar spirit of worship and uh, things like that. So that's why I'm leaning in that direction. However, um, uh, Dan Bartucci, I don't know if you've met him. He, he leads here a lot and he preaches occasionally. <laughs> Dan keeps encouraging me to plant a church there. And he says he wants to come and be at the church <laughs> if I plant a church. Um, I, I get a kick out of that. I'm honored by that. But his wife has actually looked at places to buy in the area, which gets me, you know, 
I laugh at that. And especially if you sell a house in New York, you can buy more there, you know, because of that. So that's another possibility, but it would require like Mene Mene Tekel Parson written on the wall um, for that. And somebody to say, Pastor Steve, I believe in you. Here's a check for $100,000, you know. Then I would say, okay, the Lord is saying plant the church. But <laughs> that hasn't happened. I don't expect that to happen. But uh, those are the things that they're unfolding. Now, I'm talking far too much because we have a lot to do tonight. This will be the most ambitious evening of the entire section of Jeremiah. However, as I've gone through the passages, it's appropriate that it's all tucked, uh, hangs together. We are going to read a lot. So if you have mercy on me, we're going to you know, read. And the very last chapter, 52, I probably will not read because you've actually heard it already. And that is the end of Zedekiah. Um, it kind of like does it as a bookend. But chapter 50 and 51, very important um, for multiple reasons. We'll get to that in a little while. But first, we have our last quiz, last opportunity for, for Ken to get, you know, 100% here. And he can hang his head high or hold his head high instead of hang it low. Um, here we go. The Philistines are probably from what place? Now, we talked about this in class. It didn't show up in the text directly, except that it mentioned this place. Greece, Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, Cyprus, Crete. And the answer is Crete. Very controversial passage in the Gospels, I shouldn't say the Gospels, in Paul's writing, that Cretans are all, uh, Cretans are all liars. And so it was uh, an insult in those days to call somebody a Cretan. Um, but before that reputation came, they are considered to be probably the people that populated what became the land of the Philistines. Number two. Is that considered Asia Minor also? Say it again. Is it considered Asia Minor? Well, I don't think so. Um, I, it's a fair question. You know how, like, Long Island is part of North America, but, you know, it's not connected. I, it, it could be, but I don't think so. I think it's just viewed as an independent island. Number two, Jeremiah started his ministry in what year? Now, from September till now, I hope somebody might remember this date. And the date is 627. And only one answer. So what a piece of cake is that one. Kenwin, did you get that one right? Thank the Lord. Oh, that just gives my heart peace to know that you, you got that one right. So let's look at the next one. What nations attacked the Philistines implied in Jeremiah's prophecy? Now, there are two attacks talked about in the passage, and one seems to be one country, one seems to be another, and the answer is Egypt and Babylon. Egypt and Babylon. Um, both went through. And the challenge of where the Philistines have their land, it's on the coastal highway. And so all the big armies go through their land. And so they can get trampled on pretty easily by these bigger nations, which was always Egypt. And on the other side were the Assyrians or the Babylonians or the Medes and the Persians. Number four. Which nation gets the longest prophecy of judgment? I should say, to this point. Babylon's going to cream it. Babylon's judgment is so massive. So beyond that, kind of a surprising in some respects, because we don't think of this country a lot. But it's Moab. Moab becomes this dominant uh, prophetic word that, that God gives. And he goes, I think 20 towns are mentioned. Um, in terms of judgment on this town, judgment on that town, judgment on this town, judgment on that town. So it's a very conclusive. But there's hope at the end that they will be restored. In fact, a lot of these prophetic words have this hope at the end. They will be restored. I love that because I think of my own life not that great sometimes, and yet God in his mercy keeps giving grace um, some of you, out of curiosity, who saw the Jesus Revolution? Uh, a bunch of you. Good. But in the movie, it caused people to want to be curious about Lonnie Frisbee. 
Like, who is this guy? And then you look, you find out he died of AIDS, and you know, you read different things, you hear different things on the internet, YouTube. But I listened to an, an hour and a half interview with Lonnie Frisbee's brother. Very intriguing. And uh, for example, um, Lonnie struggled with homosexuality. He was abused as a child by his babysitter, a male babysitter, that his mother kept saying, you listen to him, he's a gentleman. But he could never get a word into his mother that he hurts me, you know, all these kinds of things. Anyway, he later on would occasionally succumb to this temptation. He never affirmed it. He never thought that was in the center of God's will. He would, he would uh, repent and, and come, come clean. This is his brother speaking, uh, what I'm saying right now. And um, it was an interesting story, but here's what his brother said. Here's the question. Did God use Lonnie Frisbee despite his fallenness or through his fallenness? That's a great question. Because I think that God, you know how Joseph says, what you did, you meant for evil? But God meant it for good and for the saving of thousands? I don't think he ever wants us to sin, but we have a God who can turn mourning into dancing. We have a God who can turn sin into righteousness because of the way he does. That, see, if he couldn't, that would mean Satan gets a victory. Well, Satan doesn't get any victories in the end. And so I, I think his brother's statement of, I think God even used Lonnie through his sin to become a broken man to be usable by God. And when you look at the, the movie, the movie is, of course, a snapshot of uh, a year and a half in, in Lonnie's life, but he's clearly a catalyst for something amazing that happened in terms of the, the Jesus movement. And how this has to do with Moab, I cannot remember for the second. Oh, I know what it is. <laughs> I know what it was. That God says he's going to restore them. So even though they're going through judgment, there will be a restoration. Number five, which poor gods have to pack their bags and go into exile or are punished? Chemish, the gods of Egypt, Molech, Zeus. And the answer is all of them except Zeus. Zeus does not play into the Bible. Well, maybe Mars Hill when Paul goes there, but he doesn't make mention of Zeus. But these other gods are mentioned in the prophetic word that came last week. And all of them end up being impotent, useless, pack their beds, you know, they have nothing. They can't contribute to anything that's going on. Number six, the primary lessons of Jeremiah 46 to 49. Now this is your teacher's conclusion here, using the test that I always love to give you. If you're having your morning quiet time, you got your cup of coffee here, and you got Jeremiah 46 to 49, and you go, oh my goodness, I don't get any of this. I don't have any blessing today before I go to work. Hold on, ask the Holy Spirit to give you something. And so what is it? The Lord is Lord over all nations. Pride comes before the fall. Babylon will rule over all. Israel has sinned. And it's the first two that I strongly suggested. Each of those nations, there are elements of pride or dependence on their riches and not on the Lord. And the fact that God is giving these prophetic words to Jeremiah concerning other nations shows that God's over all nations. And that, to me, brings incredible comfort. It absolutely does. You know, in 2016, when uh, the liberals are all moping, oh, Trump is president, and then fast forward four years when Biden wins and all the conservatives are moping, oh, Biden is president. And I said, did you read the same Bible I read? Do you not know, have you not heard, I sit enthroned above the circle of the earth. I bring princes to naught and reduce rulers to nothing. Breathe in, breathe out, God is over the whole earth, no matter who is the current leader. And so that should bring we believers comfort, even when we're persecuted. If you live in Nigeria, and you know it seems like the various Muslim communities are overthrowing or killing 
you know, Christians of northern Mozambique or, or Syria or Pakistan. And you're like, how can this happen? Breathe in, breathe out, even there. The Lord is in charge and nothing can happen outside of his authority. And that is a beautiful thing. Quick story. So do people come here to Pastor Steve's Bible class purely because he gives disseminated information from the Bible? Yes, yeah, some, but let's face it, people like stories too. And I love telling stories. So we have this woman in our church. Um, she hasn't come Sunday morning for a while, but she still comes to prayer meeting from time to time. But she is from Iran. And she had a dream after she came to faith, when you go home to Iran, bring Bibles. And she's like, Lord, that's dangerous if I bring Bibles into Iran. But she obeyed. She brings them to the security. The people in front of her have their bags checked. The people behind her have their bags checked. She walks through. And I might add, her parents came to faith. And that's who the Bibles were for. But I say that because here in Iran, not known as the bastion of Bible thumping Christians, she was preserved. God can rule over all nations. I love that. Absolutely love it. Okay, which brings us to the next one, number seven. Which place did God say, I don't light in? In fact, I made the comment, he went on vacation there once, you know, I'm quoting the commentator. Was it Moab, Kir Hasheth, Halan, Damascus? And the answer is Damascus. Damascus is one of these places that even in our, my lifetime, it was, a, it was a peaceful and beautiful city. But then, you know, in the late 70s, 80s, it became just a war zone. But it was a beautiful, beautiful city even in our uh, day and age. Number eight, the people of Kedar are descended from Abraham, Cain, Ishmael, Jacob. Well, the answer is Abraham and Ishmael. Now, Ishmael is what I said in class, but who's Ishmael's daddy? You know, so yeah, I didn't connect the dots, but there was another you know, brother that was involved and, you know, the whole story gets complex. But remember, Ishmael was the son of who? Anyone Hagar. remember? Hagar, exactly. Not the son of promise, but he was the son of Abraham. So he is a descendant of Abraham, which makes me think of an old Sunday school song. Father Abraham has seven sons. <laughs> Do you want to sing it with me there, Wayne? You know, I bet you know that song. It's a classic. Number nine, the Edomites are descended from Esau, Jacob, Edomine, Obadiah. Now, see, I totally made up. <laughs> it is Esau, Esau, Esau. So if you put C, you fell for one of my tricks. It's like, oh, it's obvious. It's part of the name. Must be that one. But you forget I'm evil at heart. The heart is desperately wicked, Jeremiah says. I have that in me, so I'm going to go for the evil. All right, here we go. Number 10, last one. The term horn conveys A, weakness, B, power, C, wickedness, D, pagan worship. And the answer is power. Now, in our passage, the prophetic word said the horn is broken, but that was referring to the power is broken. But when we, we gave the illustration last week about uh, Revelation, when Jesus is portrayed as having seven horns, it's referring to he has perfect power. The horn meaning power, seven of them conveying perfection from the Hebrew scriptures. By the way, that's the kind of thing we're going to talk about on our how to read the Bible for all it's worth how to pick up little clues like that so we're able to understand what's uh, going on in the text. So, Ken, was this the magic number? No, it was not. It was not. It was not. But you know what? You've... The next week, the, the, the yeah, next week quiz, which doesn't exist, you can just give yourself you know, a 100% on that and you'll be, you'll be good to go. 
All right, we're looking at chapter 50 tonight, and it is, as I said, a massive amount of reading. Um, so I am going to read quickly and then stop at key little places. But there are some things that I want to mention in a preliminary way as we uh, move on. Do you remember in Exodus chapter 5, verse 2? So I know you're all going to church on Sunday morning. And you probably heard when Pastor Henry taught on this, Pharaoh asked an incredible question. It was a great question. It was the kind of question that if you're a small group leader, you're like so glad that the person asked that question. It was, who is the Lord? Now he added the extra line, who is the Lord that I should listen to him? And you know what he's going to find out? I'll tell you who the Lord is. He's the Lord who brings flies. He's the Lord who turns the Nile into blood. He's the Lord. And you just go down the line. That's who the Lord is. And by the end, he certainly knows who the Lord is as the Red Sea swallows up all his soldiers. But in that sense, these two chapters are going to answer who is the Lord. We're going to see that uh, wonderfully described. The next one is... Who is the Lord like, or what is he like? People want to know, what is God like? And this passage helps us understand that. Now, there's another part of this. Egypt, you know, you go through Exodus here as a church. Egypt becomes a metaphor for so many things. It becomes a metaphor for sin. It comes, becomes a metaphor for rejection of God. In Deuteronomy 17, the Lord says to future kings that won't even be around for hundreds of years, don't go back to Egypt for horses. So it's, it's a metaphor for getting more wealth. It's a metaphor for getting more spices and leeks and onions and all these kind of things. It becomes a very powerful metaphor. From this point on, Babylon becomes a very important metaphor. Now, which book in the New Testament is going to really pick up on this metaphor? It's the book of Revelation. And these two chapters are where John is going to get his metaphor for what he sees in his vision when he sees the, the whore of Babylon. These chapters help us see that. So we're not just looking at two chapters that describe Babylon as this mean nation that's going to get its comeuppance. Babylon will now have significant influence in terms of how we even see. Like Egypt connects to sin, Babylon connects to sin. How Egypt needed to be crushed, Babylon was going to be crushed. But in some respects, Babylon even takes on a greater life because it's going to speak in Revelation about the culmination of all events when God brings justice to this broken world. He's going to turn this world, which right now feels completely upside down, and he's going to turn it right side up. That's the whole point of the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, even though it seems confusing to many people, at the end of the day, is a book about hope. It's saying that everything you open your eyes, read in your newspaper, watch on TV, that you know is wrong, he's going to fix. He's going to fix it all. And part of the metaphor that John will use is from these two chapters. So here are six major themes that come from Jeremiah 50 and 51. Um, and, and I'm just kind of giving you this so you can get the big picture idea. The violence of Babylon will be avenged. The violence of Babylon will be avenged. So God's going to fix this. The arrogance of Babylon will be brought low. I mean, Babylon was top of the world. They will be brought low. The gods of Babylon will be powerless to save them. Because they are not gods. The land of Babylon will be devastated by enemies from the north. The fall of Babylon will signal the restoration and return of Israel. And finally, the fate of Babylon carries cosmic 
significance. That's what we just talked about in terms of, you know, the book of Revelation. Now, some of you are thinking to yourself, there are no more quizzes. I don't have to remember these at all. So just, just teach away, Pastor Steve. I'll, I'll try to pay, a, you know, pay attention as I'm sleeping here. Now, here's the thing. I grant you, if I was in your place, I might not be taking a note down on these, but I might take note of something that I need to hear. Because the reason why we even have this class is not to do good on quizzes. It's to do good on life. That I might love my children more, love my fellow man more, love my wife more, become a good citizen, and of course, mostly, honor the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, and strength. That's really what it comes down to. And so, I had told you previously that Jeremiah finished his last reading, or last prophecy, when he gave the one about the people staying in Egypt. Don't do it. Go out. If you stay here, you'll be destroyed. That was his last prophecy on the timeline. This is probably in a letter that he wrote to the exiles in 594 BC. 594 BC. Now, put your thinking caps on, boys and girls. What year was it, Jerusalem finally destroyed? The temple and everything in it? 587. 587. Excellent. Amen. You know, it gives, it gives a teacher chills up and down the spine when somebody actually remembers that. Right, Barbara? I mean, it, it's exciting. It's like, wow, somebody learned something. It's good. It feels good. But when we uh, look at this date, it's well before then. Now, here's what's interesting. Jeremiah is getting accused of treason because... You need to surrender. You need to go to Babylon. And Zedekiah and the others are saying, this guy has to die. What's going on with this? He's treasonous. But this is well before the final occupation. Jeremiah sends a letter to the exiles, which we're going to find out at the end. He is to read, roll up the scroll, attach it to a rock, and throw it into the Euphrates. In other words, it's probably dangerous stuff because Babylon probably would not like a prophetic word about its destruction. But that's exactly what Jeremiah gives. This shows that he is not trying to just appease the Babylonians. To the contrary, he just says what God tells him to say. And so well before the destruction of Jerusalem, Jeremiah prophesies the destruction of Babylon, which is huge. In our day and age, it would be the equivalent of the prophecy of the destruction of the United States, you know, the most dominant world power or something like that. That's what this is the equivalent of. So this section goes, go, is going to break down into what I'm going to call six movements six movements and i'll let you know when we get to each of them and what their primary uh idea is if the, if there is a primary idea with that in mind um let's dive into our massive text this is the word the lord spoke through jeremiah the prophet concerning babylon and the land of the babylonians chapter 50 verse 1 Announce and proclaim among the nations. Lift up a banner and proclaim it. Keep nothing back, but say, Babylon will be captured. Bel will be put to shame. Marduk fill with terror. Okay, let's pause there for a moment. Let me introduce you to uh, Bel Merodach, also known as Marduk. So he's the guy on the right with the thunderbolts bringing peace to chaos, which is what that creature in front of him symbolizes. Now, here is a beautiful example of Hebrew poetry. Bel means Lord, 
Marduk is witch lord. But notice the parallelism in Hebrew poetry. Bel will be put to shame. Marduk filled with terror. Same person. All it is is just poetically separating them because if you were in Babylon, you might call him Bel Marduk or Bel Merodach. And that is how this is going to unfold. Her images will be put to shame and her idols filled with terror. A nation from the north will attack her and lay waste to her land. Now for Jeremiah, for the entire book, the north becomes a metaphor for trouble coming. Remember at the very beginning of Jeremiah, there was a cauldron of boiling water that is poured out from the north. And it's going to be Babylon will be sweeping over. But for the first chapters of Jeremiah, Babylon was not man mentioned. It was just the north. So when this phrase is mentioned, the exiles who are hearing it, they know, looks like someone's getting their comeuppance coming here. The power from the north, not defined just yet, will be defined a little later, but a power is coming that is going to overturn the apple carts, lay waste. No one will live in it. Both people and animals flee, will flee away. And now comes the first of six movements. First movement starts in verse 4. It is chapter 50, 4, verse 4 to verse 20. And this is, you might say, our introduction movement. In those days <clears throat> and at that time, which is another way of saying the day of the Lord, the Yom Yahweh, in those days at that time, declares the Lord, the people of Israel and the people of Judah together will go in tears to seek the Lord their God. They will ask the way to Zion and turn their faces towards it. They will come and bind themselves to the Lord in an everlasting covenant that will not be forgotten. So this is the beginning, a declaration of victory. Good news is coming. The people will come to the Lord. This is in part fulfilled when Cyrus says, you guys can go home, which is going to take place in 537 BC. Um, and that's, that's going to be big and exciting news. It's mentioned by Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 40, and this is cool, 150 years before it's going to happen, Isaiah says in chapter 40, comfort, comfort my people. Her long service is over. Let Israel know that she has paid double for her sins. And then a passage that you're very familiar with, a voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the path for the Lord. Every gospel writer mentions that referring to Jesus, but it most immediately refers to making straight the path for them to leave Babylon to come home to Israel. So this paragraph here is a culmination of all kinds of passages about the restoration. But clearly, Israel doesn't quite get this right until the final culmination of days because Israel never quite perfectly followed the Lord. And so we have a hint here of what is coming when Cyrus releases them, but ultimately at the end of days. Verse 6, my people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have led them astray, caused them to roam on the mountains. Who are the shepherds? The, leaders. the kings, yeah, the leaders, exactly. They wandered over the mountain and hill. They forgot their own resting place. Whoever found them devoured them. Their enemies said, we are not guilty, for they sinned against the Lord. Their verdant pasture, the Lord, the hope of their ancestors. This is a beautiful description of God, by the way. Remember the question, what is God like? A verdant pasture hope of their ancestors oh i love that 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 is one well, you know like when people make plaques to hang on your wall nobody puts this one there but it is so beautiful what does verdant mean green it, it is it is a description of a lush pasture pasture what is god like he's a lush pasture he feeds you he comforts you he's the place where you want your sheep to be the hope of your ancestors so if you have a believing grandpa, a believing mom, and they had hope in their darkest times, 
You want that hope. That's what God is like, the hope of your ancestors. Free out of Babylon, leave the land of the Babylonians and be like the ghosts that, excuse me, the goats that lead the flock. For I will stir up and bring against Babylon an alliance of great nations from the north, a uh, land of the north. They will take up their positions against her. From the north, she will be captured. Their arrows will be like skilled warriors who do not return empty-handed. So Babylonia will be plundered. All who plunder her will have their fill, declares the Lord, because you rejoice and are glad, you who pillage you uh, pillage my inheritance. That, now, by the way, this rejoice and be glad is an insult to them, Babylon, because they pillaged the inheritance. Because you frolic like a heifer. This is pride. Threshing grain and neigh like stallions. Your mother will be greatly ashamed. She who gave you birth will be disgraced. She will be last, uh, least of the nations. A wilderness, a dry land, a desert. Because the Lord's anger will not be inhabited because of the Lord's anger will not be inhabited but will be completely desolate all who pass Babylon will be appalled they will scoff because of her wounds take up your positions around Babylon all who draw the bow shoot at her spare no arrows for she has sinned against the Lord shout against her on every side she surrenders her towers fall her walls are torn down this is the vengeance of the Lord takes on her to do to her as she has done to others. Cut off from Babylon the sower and the reaper with his sickle at harvest because the sword of the oppressor. Let everyone return to their own people. Let everyone flee to their own land. Israel is a scattered flock that lions have chased away. The first to devour them was the king of Assyria. The last to crush their bones was Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Now I'm going to pause here for a moment because I want to show you various empires. So this was the Assyrian Empire. This is the empire before Babylon. So he mentions here, the first to devour them was the king of Assyria. And you can see this, this purple color spread over the land. But just after 722, when the northern kingdom was defeated by the Assyrians, and the Assyrians tried to defeat Judah in 701 and failed. But then it starts getting weaker. And at the time of Josiah, he's actually able to make incursions into what was northern Israel because there's no power. Assyria has gotten weak and feeble. But another nation's on the rise, and that is Babylon. And that is what ultimately overcame the Assyrian Empire. And pretty much everything that was Assyria became the Babylonian Empire. Now, quick word, the Assyrians are like brutes. They're just like, like, kind of like the difference between Sparta and Athens. Sparta was known for its military prowess, but not known for literature. Athens, known for the philosophers, the Epicureans, you know, all these people who are willing to talk about ideas. That's Babylon. Babylon, that's why they brought in the cream of Israel. They wanted to get their knowledge and, and grow and, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> mature. And so <coughs> that is what this poetry is saying. First Assyria, then Babylon. Therefore, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. I will punish the king of Babylon and his land as I punished Assyria. Like there's no Assyrian empire. The Lord says, okay, you guys are happy, proud, you're going down. But I will bring Israel back to her own pasture. And now it gives these beautiful poetic descriptions. They will graze on Carmel they, and Bashan. Their appetite will be satisfied in the hills of Ephraim and Gilead. All these are just depictions, pictures of places in Israel where there's going to be hope and comfort once again in those days and at that time declares the lord now get ready for an amazing verse search will be made for israel's guilt but there will be none for the sins of judah but none will be found for i will forgive the remnant i spare now we just read 
how many chapters about Israel's guilt? And what did we just read? Washed away. Though her sins be as scarlet, Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 says, they shall be white as snow. And uh, the prophet says, I will put them at the depths of the sea. And I always love the way Corey Tim Boom said, and she, he puts a sign that says, no fishing. No fishing. I think the biggest problem we have with sin is us. We don't forgive ourselves. We're always conscious of our sin. The, you know, the enemy, I walk to church on Sunday mornings, it's just a mile from my house. But the enemy sometimes tries to get a hold of me on that walk. Who do you think you are to preach today? Come on! And he'll remind me of every bad thing I've ever done. Sometimes he doesn't have to go too far back either. <laughs> but then the Lord comes in and says, Steve, Satan's absolutely right. You do screw up. But you know what? My grace is sufficient. And I, and I want you to read that line. <clears throat> Search will be made for Ken's sin. Barbara's sin, since you laugh a little there. <laughs> and none will be found. And none will be found. This is where, if we were a shouting church, we might say, Glory! Good news. That is really good news. Verse 21, attack the land of Marathon. Oh, you know what? You're so sweet, oh, Bob. But I actually came with water. Oh, okay. But sometimes I cough anyway. But my brother brings me water. I shall partake of the spring of life here. Yeah, nice and cold. Lot, lot of to read. <laughs> cold. Colder than the water I had. So verse 21, attack the land of Marathon. Now, what in the world is Marathon? It is where the Tigris and the Euphrates converge. So we're talking the Babylonian Empire. Why is it saying Marathon? Because it's poetry. It's giving a different way of describing the same thing. Babylon. And those who live in Pecod, same principle. Pursue, kill, and destroy them, declares the Lord. Now, verse 21 begins our second movement, movement number two. This is chapter 50, verse 21 to 32. 21 to 32. And what is the primary point of this? Destruction of Babylon. No surprise in the sense that this is a prophecy about Babylon. Goes on, <clears throat> do everything I've commanded you. The noise of the battle is in the land, the noise of great destruction. How broken and shattered is the hammer of the whole earth. Now, he's saying this, Babylon was the hammer, but the hammer's now shattered. So the one that was doing the destroying is no longer able to destroy. It's being shattered. How desolate is Babylon among the nations. I set a trap for you, Babylon, and you were caught before you knew it. You were found and captured because you opposed the Lord. The Lord has opened his arsenal and brought out the weapons of his wrath for the sovereign Lord Almighty, excuse me, has work to do in the land of the Babylonians. Come against her from afar. Break open the granaries. Pile up her heaps of grain. Completely destroy her. Leave her no remnant. Kill all her young bulls. Let them go down to the slaughter. Woe to them, for their day has come. The time for them to be punished. Listen to the fugitives and the refugees from Babylon declaring, uh, uh, declaring in Zion for uh, how the Lord our God has taken vengeance, vengeance for his temple. Summon archers against Babylon, all those who draw a bow, and camped all around her. Let no one escape. Repay her for her deeds. Do to her as she has done, for she has defied the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, her young men will fall in the streets. Her soldiers will be silenced in that day, declares the Lord. See, I am against you. Here it is, pride. You arrogant one, declares the Lord. The Lord Almighty, for your day has come, the time for you to be punished. The arrogant one will stumble and fall, and no one will help her. I will kindle a fire in her towns that will consume all who are around her. OK? 
Okay, that's the end of that movement. Now pause and think of this question. If this came in 594 and you are in exile in Babylon, how does it feel reading this? I would think it feels pretty good because you're reading about the destruction about the people holding you captive. So when you see this, let's, let's picture, let's say you're a football player and you have a recording, uh, you know, a video of your favorite victory over your nemesis. And you want to watch the game again. And you watch the game again. And you watch the game again because it's sweet. And, you know, and meanwhile, there's another side that's unhappy in this, the team that lost that, you know, game. But that is what these words would be to people who held captive. This is hope. This is salve. Because it means that God is going to turn this upside down world and make it right side up. So it's, it's a good feeling, which moves us now to movement three which is verse 33 to 46, which in part is about Israel's restoration. This is what the Lord Almighty says. The people of Israel are oppressed. The people of Judah as well. All their captives hold them fast, refusing to let them go. Yet their Redeemer is strong. The Lord Almighty is his name. He will vigorously defend their cause so that he may bring rest to their land. Beautiful. I mean, that's another one. You can put it on a plaque. I love that. The Lord is vigorously defending their cause. Vigorously. Redeemer is strong. But unrest to those who live in Babylon, a sword against the Babylonians, declares the Lord, against those who live in Babylon, against her officials and wise men, a sword against her false prophets. They will become fools, a sword against her warriors. They will be filled with terror. Notice the prophets become fools because they said the wrong thing. Soldiers become filled with terror, not useful. So these are again parallelism in Hebrew of a reversal that's taking place. A sword against her horses and chariots and against the foreigners in her ranks. They will become weaklings. A sword against her treasures. They will become plundered. A drought on her waters. They will dry up. For it is a land of idols and idols will go mad with terror. So desert creatures and hyenas will live there and the owl will dwell there. It will never again be inhabited or lived in from generation to generation. Now I'm going to pause and I'm going to go forward here just a little bit. Here's Babylon today. Isn't that a lovely place? Want to have a home there? Now Iraq, when Saddam Hussein was there, tried to make it a tourist attraction. So he built kind of a fake Babylon on the site. So when you go there, you'll see like he kind of tried to restore different elements of the original Babylon, but it's not a place where you live. It's a place where hyenas and jackals live. And so just pointing, you know, where this ultimately unfolds here. Okay, going back, uh, verse 41. Look, an army is coming from the north. A great nation and many kings are being stirred up from the ends of the earth. They are armed with bows and spears. They are cruel without mercy. They sound like a roaring sea as they ride on their horses. They come like men in battle formation to attack you, daughter Babylon. Once again, that endearment, daughter Babylon. I always find that interesting. God, I think, views all these peoples as his children sometimes in need of judgment, but it is an endearment. The king of Babylon has heard the reports about them. His hand hangs limp. Anguish has gripped him. Pain like that of a woman in labor, like a lion coming from Jordan's thickets to the rich pasture land. I will chase Babylon from its land in an instant. Who is the chosen one I will appoint for this? Who is like me? Who can challenge me? This is the Lord speaking. And what shepherd 
can stand against me. If God be for us, who can stand against us? The scripture declares in the New Testament. Therefore, hear what the Lord has planned against Babylon. He who has purposed against the land of the Babylonians, the young of the flock will be dragged away. Their pasture will be appalled at their fate. At the sound of Babylon's capture, the earth will tremble. Its cry will resound among the nations. Okay, chapter 51, movement four. So movement four. This is verse one to verse 33. And this would be best clarified, the tirade against Babylon continues. So it's, in other words, a continuation of the argument. This is what the Lord says. See, I will stir up a spirit of a destroyer against Babylon and the people of Leb Kamaya. Now, Leb Kamaya means in Hebrew, heart of my adversaries. Heart of my adversaries, poetic language of being a balance of the spirit of the destroyers. So the adversaries of Babylon are coming together. I will send foreigners to Babylon to winnow her and to devastate her land. They will oppose her on every side. You've heard this phrase in the past, terror on every side, same kind of thing here, in the day of disaster. Let not the archer string his bow, nor let him put on his armor. Do not spare her young men, completely destroy her army. They will fall down slain in Babylon, fatally wounded in her streets. For Israel and Judah have not been forsaken by their God, the Lord Almighty, though their land is full of guilt before the Holy One of Israel. Flee from Babylon, run for your lives. Do not be destroyed because of her sins. It is time for the Lord's vengeance. He will repay her for what she deserves. Babylon was a gold cup in the Lord's hand. Remember Babylon, my servant? Babylon served the purposes of the Lord. Gold cup in my hand. She made the whole earth drunk and the nations drank her wine. Now, that phrase shows up almost, um, well, let me say it correctly. I've said this to you before. The book of Revelation contains no quotes from the Old Testament, but it alludes to the Old Testament more than any other book in the New Testament. And this is the allusion now. This is Revelation 18. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority in the earth and it was illumined by his splendor. With a mighty voice, he shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling for demons, the haunt of every impure spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable animal. For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her. The merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. Now, you're reading Revelation for the first time and you've never read the Old Testament, or at least you haven't read the book of Jeremiah. But if you read Jeremiah, this prophetic word pops. And what it means is that God is coming to bring that which is unrighteous down in judgment and to elevate that which is righteous. And so just reading Revelation, I'm like, why is he bringing up Babylon suddenly? You scratch your head and you're like, I don't understand what John is doing. But the person next to you who has been in Pastor Steve's Jeremiah class is going, ah, oh, let me explain this to you. Let me make it clear to you as Pastor Steve's head expands and becomes full of pride and God has to bring me low. So we must move on. All right, here we go. Nations drank her wine, therefore they have now gone mad. Babylon will suddenly fall and be broken. Fallen, fallen is Babylon, Revelation. Well over her, get bomb for her pain. Perhaps she can be healed. We would have healed Babylon 
but she cannot be healed. Let us leave her and each go to our own land. For her judgment reaches to the skies. It rises high as the heavens. The Lord has vindicated us. Come, let us tell Zion what the Lord our God has done. Sharpen the arrows, take up the shields. The Lord has stirred up the kings of the Medes. Okay, this is your answer. This is the people of the north that are now being given a name. It's the story of the Medes and the Persians and the conquest. So you see in the map here, the Babylonian empire. This is the empire of the Medes and the Persians. This is what will take over. And it is recorded this defeat in a book in the Bible besides Jeremiah. Does anyone remember? Esther. Say it again. Esther, um, Esther is afterwards. And Daniel. Daniel. Beautiful. So Daniel chapter 5. This is the inscription that was written. Mene, Mene, Tekel, Parson. And what, here is what the words mean. Mene, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Paris, your kingdom will be divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then, at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple, gold chain placed around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, the king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. So you get to hear what ultimately happened. Not going to happen for a while. But in our passage, what we're seeing is Jeremiah mentioning by name. Now at this point in 594, Nebuchadnezzar is second to none. It is like inconceivable. The, the Medes, you mean that tribal people over there? Who are you kidding? It's, it's, it would be like saying Cuba will conquer the United States. And you're like, excuse me? Impossible. And Jeremiah is given this word. He's naming names. It's going to be the Medes who do it. But it will happen exactly. And of course, outside history, biblical history, all confirm this event. Because his purpose is to destroy Babylon. The Lord will take vengeance, vengeance for his temple. Lift up a banner against the walls of Babylon. Reinforce the guard. Station the watchman. Prepare an ambush. The Lord will carry out his purpose, his decree against the people of Babylon. You who live by many waters and are rich in treasures, your end is come. Babylon is a sweet place to live. Two rivers, not one, count them, two rivers. And they are the cream of civilization. People come there for knowledge, for wisdom, for treasures, all coming to an end. The time for you to be destroyed. The Lord Almighty has sworn by himself. I always get a kick out of that. Who does God swear by? Himself. <laughs> Can't top himself. I will surely fill you with troops as a swarm of locusts. And they will shout and triumph over you. And here comes, remember the question? Who is the Lord? What is he like? He made the earth by his power. He founded the world by his wisdom and stretched out the heavens by his understanding. When he thunders the waters in the heavens roar, he makes clouds rise from the ends of the earth. He sends lightning with the rain and brings out the wind from his storehouses. This is a paragraph that I would say is contrary to the idea of, for example, evolution, which is, you know, it just happened this way by fate, by accident, by just the concurrence of different things. No, the world, the universe is here by the wisdom of God. This is a declarative statement of God that this world, everything we see was put together with wisdom. Verse 17, everyone is senseless without knowledge compared to him. Every goldsmith is shamed by his idols. The images he makes are fraud. They have no breath in them. They are worthless, objects of mockery. When their judgment comes, they will perish. He who is the 
portion of Jacob is not like these. Portion of Jacob, beautiful phrase. He who gives Jacob everything she needs. Jacob, statement of Israel. Jacob has two names, Jacob, Israel, poetic. For he is the maker of all things. Who is the Lord? He is the maker of all things including the people of his inheritance. The Lord Almighty is his name. You are my war club, my weapon for battle. And now comes a little poetry here, or more poetry. With you, I shatter the nations. With you, I destroy the kingdoms. With you, I shatter the horse and the rider. With you, I shatter the chariot and the driver. With you, I shatter man and woman. With you, I shatter old man and youth. With you, I shatter young men and young women. With you, I shatter the shepherd of the flock. With you, I shatter the farmer and the oxen. With you, I shatter the governors and the officials. Before your eyes, I will repay Babylon and all who live in Babylonia for all the wrong they have done in Zion, declares the Lord. Again, the year is 594. You're in exile. And probably in the secret of your home, you're rehearsing Jeremiah's prophecy. Every time some slave master tells you what's up and what's down, you say, yes, sir. And then go to your room and say, destroy the kingdoms and shatter the chariots and shatter you know you you just kind of repeat this poetry to yourself to keep you going verse 25 i am against you you destroying mountain jeremiah had called in the past babylon a mountain who destroy the whole earth declares the lord i will stretch out my hand against you and roll you off the cliffs and make you a burned out mountain no rock will be taken from you for a cornerstone, nor any stone for a foundation. For you will be desolate forever, declares the Lord. Lift a banner in the land. Blow the trumpet among the nations. Prepare the nations for battle against her. Summon against her these kingdoms, Ararat, Mine, and Ashkenaz. All these are people or lands in Babylonia. Appoint a commander against her. Send up horses like a swarm of locusts. Prepare the nations for a battle against her. The king of the Medes, their governors and their officials and their countries, they rule. The land trembles and reads for the Lord's purposes against Babylon's stand to lay waste the land of Babylon so that no one will live there. Babylon's warriors have stopped fighting. They remain in their strongholds. Their strength is exhausted. They have become weaklings. Her dwellings are set on fire. The bars of her gates are broken. One courier follows another. The messenger follows the messenger to announce to the king of Babylon that his entire city is captured. The river crossing seas. The marshes set on fire. The soldiers terrified. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Daughter Babylon is like a threshing floor. At a time it is trampled. The time to harvest her will soon come. Which moves us now to the fifth movement, which is chapter 51, verse 34 to 44. 34 to 44. Now at this point, this is the first time poetically the exiles themselves get to speak so this is their voice crying out nebuchadnezzar king of babylon has devoured us he has thrown us into confusion he has made us an empty jar like a serpent he has swallowed us and filled his stomach with our delicacies and then has spewed us out may the violence done to our flesh be on babylon say the inhabitants of zion May our blood be on those who live in Babylonia, says Jerusalem. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. So the exiles say that, and now the Lord speaks. See, I will defend your cause and avenge you. I will dry up her sea and make her springs dry. Babylon will be a heap of ruins, a haunt of jackals, an object of horror and scorn, a place where no one lives. Her people all roar like young lions. They growl like the lion cubs. But while they are aroused, I will set out and feast for them and make them drunk 
The one who makes others drunk is now going to be made drunk so that they shout with laughter. By the way, do you remember the setting of Mene, Mene, Teko, Parson? They're all getting wasted with the dishware the, 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 from the temple. I will make them drunk with laughter, then sleep forever and not awake, declares the Lord. I will bring them down like lambs to the slaughter, like rams and goats. How Shishak has been captured. Shishak is a cryptogram. What in the world is a cryptogram? It's a text in code. A text in code. But we know the answer. It means Babylon. It's a poetic way, again, of picking on Babylon. But you know what? You know, when you write a paper and you use one word too many times, you know what your professor does? He circles or she circles the word and says, find another word. Get yourself a thesaurus, okay? Jeremiah had a good thesaurus. You know, so when he's writing his poetry, he wants to use words that make it pop out. The boast of the whole earth seized how desolate Babylon will be among the nations. The sea will rise over Babylon. Its roaring waves will cover her. Her towns will be desolate, a dry and desert land, a land where no one lives, uh, through which no one travels. I will punish Bel. Now, we know who Bel is. Bel Maraduk or Molech, uh, Marduk, excuse me. It just, Bel means Lord, but poetically here, I'm going to punish the God of Babylon and make him spew out what he has swallowed. The nations will no longer stream to him and the wall of Babylon will fall as it did. Which brings us now to the last movement, which is verse 45 to 53. How they time these movements, by the way, because you know ba Jeremiah is not calling these movements. It's a literary observation. You're seeing how the tone changes, and so you see it flows in different ways. So here comes our last movement. This is kind of a hodgepodge of a variety of things, so it doesn't really have a title per se. Come out of her, my people. Run for your lives. Run from the fierce anger of the Lord. Do not lose heart or be afraid. When rumors are heard in the land, one rumor comes this year, another next. Rumors of violence in the land and of ruler against ruler. For the time will surely come when I will punish the idols of Babylon. Her whole land will be disgraced and her slain will all lie fallen within her. So the day is going to come as we're getting close to 537 that we're going to hear about there's rumblings of other countries, rumors of things going to happening, and they will hold to that and know that God is about to make his, his move. Verse 48, Then heaven and earth and all that is in them will shout for joy over Babylon, for out of the north destroyers will attack her, declares the Lord. Babylon must fall because of, because of Israel slain, just as the slain of the earth have fallen because of Babylon. You who have escaped the sword, live and uh, excuse me, leave and do not linger. Remember the Lord in a distant land, the call and call to mind Jerusalem. So that is a call for the exiles to not forget the Lord, even though they're in a foreign land. Remember the Lord in your distant land. We are disgraced, this is a quote, for we have been insulted and shame is on our faces because foreigners have entered the holy places of the Lord. That was the exile speaking. But the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will punish her idols and throughout her land the wounded will groan. Even if Babylon ascends to the heaven and fortifies her lofty stronghold, I will send destroyers against her, declares the Lord. The sound of a cry comes from Babylon, the sound of great destruction from the land of the Babylonians. The Lord will destroy Babylon. He will silence her noisy din. Waves of enemies will rage like great waters. The roar of her voices will resound and destroyer will come against Babylon. Her warriors will be captured and their bows will be broken. For the Lord is the God of retribution. He will repay in full. I will make her officials and wise men drunk. For governors and officers and warriors as well. They will sleep forever and not awake. Now we've heard this before. This is kind of a bookend for that. Declares the king 
whose name is the Lord Almighty. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Babylon's thick wall will be leveled and her high gates set afire. The people exhaust themselves for nothing. The nation's labor is only fuel for the flames. And thus ends the last poetry of the book of Jeremiah. Now comes a little narrative section, which is what dates to 594. This is the message Jeremiah the prophet gave to the staff officer Siraiah, son of Nira, son of uh, Masiah, when he went to Babylon with Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the fourth year of his reign. That's how we got the, the year of his reign. Jeremiah had written on a scroll about the disasters that would come upon Babylon, all that had been recorded concerning Babylon. He said to Siraiah, when you get to Babylon, see that you read all these words aloud. Then say, Lord, you have said you will destroy this place so that neither people nor animals will live in it. It will be a desolate forever. When you finish reading this scroll, tie a stone to it, throw it into the Euphrates. Then say, so will Babylon sink to rise no more because of disaster I will bring on her and her people will fall. The words of Jeremiah end here. Now that's scripture. The words of Jeremiah end here. Interesting. So, what's 52 then? 52 is Baruch um, or some other collator who puts it all together. Now, chapter 52 is almost word for word 2 Kings 24, verse 18 through 2 Kings 25, verse 21. It's the exact scripture. And all it is, is just saying everything that you guys know already in terms of what happened with Zedekiah. It's just repeating it, that Zedekiah has his eyes plucked out, has, sees his kids killed, and he's taken into captivity. Um, there's, there's no new information there. I do wanna say though, at the very first paragraph, Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem 11 years. His mother name was Hamutal. We don't have that word anywhere except right here in Jeremiah. This is one of the unique things of Jeremiah's passage. We don't know the significance of mom, but that's her name. So if you're looking for a good girl's name, there you got one. Um, and then it says she's the daughter of Jeremiah, different Jeremiah. We don't know who this Jeremiah is. But when you're reading through the passage, and of course you come across the word Jeremiah, you go, huh, should I know that one? You know, and no, you don't know this one. And the rest of it is just what you see in uh, 2 Kings. I want to go now to the very last paragraph. Because this is newer information. This is verse 31. In the 37th year of the exile of Jehoiachin of Judah, in the year of, the way you pronounce this is evil Marduk, became king of Babylon on the 25th day of the 12th month, he released Jehoiachin, king of Judah. The year is now, by the way, 562 to 560 BC. So about, you know, 25 years after the destruction of the temple. We read, he released Jehoiachin. He spoke kindly to him and gave him a seat of honor higher than those other kings who were with him in Babylon. So Jehoiachin put aside his prison clothes 
and for the rest of his life ate regularly at the king's table. Day by day, the king of Babylon gave Jehoiachin a regular allowance as long as he lived till the day of his death. Now, this is the guy who, even though he wasn't a great king, he did what the Lord said, surrender. He's the guy who just reigned for three months and gave up. And they went, and it's kind of like a little bookend. He did what the Lord said, and also what is noteworthy, this is the lineage of Jesus, Jehoiachin. So it's, it's part of the, the, the redemption story. Now, some closing things, and then we will be finished. Let's see if I have any. Okay. This is Isaiah the prophet, 150 years, telling what's going to happen. This is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of to subdue the nations before him and to strip kings of their armor, to open doors before him so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you. I will level the mountains. Remember Jeremiah said that Babylon is a mountain. I will level the mountains. I will break down the bronze and cut the bars of iron. It goes on from here, but I wanted you just to see Jeremiah, excuse me, Isaiah is naming names 150 years in advance who was going to be the one to destroy Babylon. It's, it's one of these amazing prophecies. Um, and so how do liberal scholarship deal with this? Oh, Jerem, uh, excuse me, Isaiah must have been written after the fact. That's the only way they come up with answers to this because it gives too much prophetic information. And yet you have people who wrote after quoting Isaiah. So it, you can't make that argument that he just wrote after these events took place. So we already looked at Revelation. Here's the lovely picture of Babylon today. Here are some conclusions, lessons learned. And this is where we wrap up this evening. We did good time. We did good. Lesson one, that the Lord reigns and is involved in the world. Um, I, I should have this as a second one here that God's purposes are realized in and through the contingencies of history. That's a beautiful statement. So the Lord reigns, is involved in his world, and that God's purposes are realized in and through the contingencies of history. And we see this time and time again. What happened during World War II to the Jewish people? Devastation, Holocaust, the Shoah. And then something happened in 1948 because there was this general overwhelming guilt of all the nations that they let this happen. And Israel becomes a nation for the first time in 2000 years, completely self-governed. Unbelievable. Who'd have thought that is a contingencies of history unfolding? You go on. That the plight of suffering people is not beyond the scope of God's power and concern. He sees it. He knows it. And he's going to make all the upside down things in this world right side up. That is a reason why Jeremiah is written that God stands over all the peoples of the earth and he ultimately brings justice. Yes, justice to his own people, but justice ultimately to the world. And, and by the way, that's the heart of the cross, Calvary, that the wrath of God had to be paid, but he allowed it to be paid upon his own son himself. That God neither forgets nor ignores those whose lives are full of pain and brokenness. He knows it. He sees it. That God acts on behalf of those who cannot defend themselves. That unjust and oppressive power structures will not endure. That raw power is not ultimate reality. It's going to come crashing down. 
that acts of callous disregard for life do not impugn divine justice, that God holds all people responsible for their actions regardless of military muscle or religious claims. And finally, that God's salvation extends beyond the borders of any one people. God is in charge. So as we wrap up, okay, I'll leave that there for you, Brother, Brother Wilson. As we wrap up Jeremiah, I will admit 18 years ago when I started teaching the Bible verse by verse here at the church, this was like the last book on my list that I wanted to do. Now, I was fearful of teaching Revelation, and I did teach Revelation, but I was fearful because it's so hard to figure out things and, you know, I have to really study. It's like a lot of work for we pastors. But the reason I did it is because you fill the room. My first class when I taught Revelation had 120 people in it. That was the biggest class by far of anyone. You guys are probably in that class in the beginning. You know, it's a big class. But I knew, Jeremiah, two things. Hard and nobody will want to come. I mean, how many of you woke up one morning and said, I feel like I need to read Jeremiah again. Nobody wakes up with that feeling. Oh, I want to read Jeremiah again. Maybe now. I mean, you'll read Jeremiah 29, 11 again. And, you know, a few little verses here and there. But as a general rule, no. But when I was this summer, I knew I'm going to be, you know, going to Nevada. Um, you know, last March, I knew. I wasn't sure of the date. And, you know, I'm thinking, what book should I do? And this book kept nagging me as to the one to do. And I thought, well, I'm going to go out with a splash. There'll be three people in this class, you know. And, uh, you know, and, and, and the truth is, it's definitely not one of the bigger classes. But you guys came online, and I appreciate you guys watching online. And I hope having taken this journey that you've seen a few things that we've learned. And I, for one, have come to really appreciate Brother Jeremiah. You know, I, you know, Steve uses props all the time when he preaches. What prophet likes to use props? Jeremiah. <laughs> you know, I, I see things of that passion. If I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire. A fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water. And they've dug for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, that cannot hold water. Call unto me and answer me, and I will, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things. Thou knowest not. You know, all these amazing verses, which now you've heard in context. And it gives us something by which we can live our lives. The most famous one of all, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, written to the exiles, a people broken, devastated. And God says, I got a plan. And you'll see that plan soon enough. Anyway, final statement. It's been a blast teaching you guys. Thank you for for being good students, and uh, maybe we'll see you online or something else. Thank you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the chance we've had to not only teach tonight, but to teach through Jeremiah, and I want to thank you personally for the chance to just teach through so much of your Bible. Father, some things I probably got right, a lot of things I got wrong, but one thing I always had is you at my back your Holy Spirit, to lead us into all truth. And for this, we are all extremely grateful. Now, Lord, as Jeremiah prophesied that you will make the path straight before us, I pray, Lord, that you will do that in our own lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. Thank you, guys.